Hey, Lois. Hi, Rabbi. Hi, Lois. Hi, David. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I think so. It's a beautiful day. Um, so again, uh, yesterday we were talking about the mitzvah to uh, have awe for the mikdash. And uh, again, his language is that is that he commanded us to fear the temple very much so that to the extent that we place a burden of fear and awe upon us, upon ourselves. Um, and, and he said at the very end, uh, it is not the temple. This is a quote from the the Sifra, it is not the temple that you fear, but he who makes his divine presence dwell in that place. But it's um, uh, in Hebrew, um, li ra, li ra, which is uh, that word that often is translated as awe, but he also added pachat. Again, that's the a trans, a translator. Um, but so therefore, there are practices which include not wearing shoes, um, uh, not make, taking shortcuts, not wearing your money belt or your um, uh, walking stick, um, and also not sitting, pointed out, not sitting. Uh, these are all uh, practices that are awe-related or fear-related. Um, in uh, it's, it, it is interesting that there are a couple times where events happen in the Torah that are said to be happening at the place of the Beis HaMikdash. It doesn't, like, for instance, um, So when uh, Yaakov has the latter dream, so it says Yaakov left Beersheba, he went to Haran, and he came upon this place, and he slept there, and um, he took some stones, and he, and he slept in that place, Bamakomahu. Then he has this dream, um, and that's the latter vision. And then it says, and Yaakov woke up from his place and he, he said, God is in this place. I don't know it. And it says, Vayira, and he, and he has the same word, the word for awe or a fear. Vayira, and he was afraid. Vayomar, mano rahamakomazet. How awesome is this place? This is the house of God. It's the gate of heaven. So the juxtaposition, he, he sees this, this must be the house of God because he's experiencing awe. Oh, he's experiencing Yira, no Ra, by year, by he was a, he was afraid or he was in awe. Ma no Ra, 
How awesome is this place? Ein Zekim Beis Elokim. So he associates awe with the bait of Elokim, with the house of God. So you'll see in Midrash, they will suggest that this is what this, what he's identifying is the place of the Beit HaMikdash and that the Beit HaMikdash is, is awesome. So that's there. And then, um, all right, so what, about, what about the fear element? That would explain because of such, if you say something is Nora, that's the same root as Yira. Right. I mean, it, it, yeah. So, but, but, there, but there's no, there's no hint of the, of the Pachad. No, but no, yeah. So he, again, I don't even know if he says the word Pachad. I mean, it says it in Hebrew there. I don't know. But that word, that word awe, like in, in many places means to be afraid. Like when it's, it uses the same word when he's, uh, when he's concerned about Aesop, he uses that same word. That word means fear. It sometimes, it, it depends on context. It can mean awe, it, but even awe has elements of fear associated with it. It's, it's not a completely, it's on some spectrum with the word fear, but it, it, it is sometimes used and in a context where it means fear, like, um, um, so another place is, um, at the end of the, um, Akeda. So the actual place of the Akeda, it just says, It says to the land of Moriah. It says the land of Moriah. Go to the land of Moriah. So eventually, the mountain where the Beit Hamikdash is is called Har Hamoriah. Uh, and he says, go up to one of the mountains in the land of Moriah. But again, the tradition is that there is an association between the Akeda and and the place where the Beit HaMikdash eventually is going to be. In fact, that stone, which is, which is called the Evan Shasia, the, that, that stone, which is supposed to represent the Holy of Holies, is, it, it is suggested was where Avraham put Yitzchak for the Akeda. But again, it's, it's very much connected, at least in Midrash, to the place where the Beit HaMikdash is. And that's the response of God. Now I see that you are one who is your Rei Elohim, which here they translate as fear. Again, you could say awe. One who's in awe of God or is fear of God. Um, and, um, and it says, uh, Avram uh, Hashem Hashem So this is a play on the word of because uh, there's this is a kind of word play. Uh, God says that I see you are in awe of me, and he uses the word um Yore Elohim Ata, and he's using the word for vision or to see this happens several times or like he lifts up in his eyes and he sees like in verse 13 he lifted up his eyes and he saw the ram so he calls the place uh uh hashem year which they are translating here as um they aren't even translating it hashem year uh uh, so Hashem is seen or, or there's a vision. But again, it seems to be a play on the word of Yira. But uh, these, but these awe words and God saying, now I see you're in awe of me, being associated with this place, that's the, that this place is meant to be a place of awe. Even Ramosha Shapiro pointed out that our own, the, the word Aron, which is 
which is in the Holy of Holies, is the word no ra backwards, no ra backwards, um, Aron and no ra. Um, so, Okay, and then we talked about the mitzvah of the Levine to guard the base of Mikdash um, and to uh, work in the base of Mikdash, uh, which was primarily the guarding and uh, the work in the choir and the symphony. Those are the primary works. Um, okay, so now we are at mitzvah 24. And it is, that is, that he commanded the priests to wash their hands and their feet anytime they needed to enter the temple chamber and do the service. And this is the sanctification of the hands and the feet. And this is his maybe exalted saying, and let Aaron and his sons wash their hands and feet from it when they enter the tent of meeting. So there's something, we call it a laver. It's a, it's a large vessel with spigots. And um, so the, the command there is to wash their hands and feet. Uh, it is interesting that we have accustomed to this day to wash our hands before we pray, um, but we don't have a custom to wash our feet. We, at, at no point uh, in the morning or and after we go to the bathroom or at any time do we have a command to wash our feet. We, we wash our hands, but we don't wash our feet. But the Kohanim um, wash their hands and their feet. Uh, and one who transgresses this positive commandment is liable for death at the hands of heaven. In other words, to do the service of God without washing your hands and feet. Meaning to say that a priest that serves in the temple without sanctification of the hands and feet is liable for death at the hands of heaven. It's not, a, it's not punished in a court. Uh, in a human court, but it's punished at the hands of heaven. And that is his, may his name be blessed, saying, they shall wash with water that they may not die. So that's in Shemot, um, uh, chapter 30, which is somewhere around Kisisa. And the regulations of this commandment have already been completely explained in the second chapter of Zvachim, Si Parsha Kitisa. There it is. And Mishnah Torah, the chosen temple, uh, eight. So I am off the bat speculating that the reason I've, I've wondered this on several occasions, but I've never done research on it. Why is it that we don't wash our feet? So my first thought is that we don't wash our feet because we don't go barefoot anymore. But I'm just going to see if quickly if anybody, halacha. Isn't the washing only for the koanim or for everybody? No, it's just for the koanim, but we model our washing our hands after the koanim. Like, for instance, when we eat, we wash our hands before we eat bread. Why do we wash our hands before we eat bread? It's, uh, it's modeled after the koanim that they... They had to wash their hands before they ate bread, or whatever, in the service of the temple. Why don't we? The Gemara says 
in Shabbos. One should wash his face, hands, and legs every day to honor his creator. The Mishnah Brewer writes in the name of the Prima Godim that nowadays, since we don't walk barefoot, there's no need to wash one's feet. This is, reasoning is also given in the note of Yehuda, although the Balatanya brings the Gemara with no comment. Um, there you go. So the Mishnah Brewer and the note of Yehuda suggests that we don't wash our feet because we don't walk barefoot. Now, they're not really talking about ritually. They're talking about more as a way of honoring Hashem. But After, this is an article by Rav Binyamin Tabori, which is at uh, Virtual Beit Midrash, my go-to place. After describing the actual building of the Mishkan, the Torah relates that the laver was placed between the Ohel Moed, tent of meeting, and the altar. Water was put in the laver, which was used to wash the hands and feet of Moshe and Aaron and his sons whenever they came to the Ohel or approached the altar. We find several, several differences between this discussion and the actual commandment regarding the laver, which appears several chapters earlier. In the beginning of Parshat Kitisa, the Torah says that the purpose of the laver was for Aaron and his sons to wash whenever they enter the Olamoid or approach the altar to perform the service. No mention is made at all of Moshe. The Torah there adds that they must wash their hands and feet and therefore not die, implying, of course, that entering the Ohel or during a voter without washing is punishable by death by heavenly court. Why is Moshe mentioned in conjunction with the laver here in Parsha Pekude, but not in Parsha Kitisa? The earlier Parsha makes no reference to Moshe for the simple reason that he's not a Kohen and therefore has no obligation to watch from the laver. During the days of Mishkan's inauguration, however, Moshe in fact served as a Kohen and so that uh, is why he's included there. Although the Torah told the Kohanim to wash their hands and feet, the Gemara constantly refers to this mitzvah as sanctification of hands and feet. In fact, Targum Uncle has translated the word lerochza as lekidush. The Rambam uh, in our mitzvah and the Sefer Achinuch and Rabbeinu Savya Gaon all count this kidush, this sanctification, as one of the 613 mitzvot. The Bahag did not count it as a positive commandment, but included in the list of which the death penalty is imposed. The Ramban interpret this to mean that the Bahag also viewed this as an independent mitzvah, but merely had a different system of enumerating the mitzvot. Uh, Rabbi Ari Leib Malin raised the question of whether this Kiddush itself is an avoda or only a heksher mitzvah. <laughs> is it a service itself or only a preparation for the performance of it? He pointed out that although considerable controversy exists as to whether wearing priestly vestments constitutes a separate mitzvah, everyone agrees that this is an independent mitzvah. This implies that it is more than just preparation for the service. It has to be considered a service itself. The Rambam codified that it must be preferred standing because this is a service in the Beit HaMikdash and therefore it should it has to be performed standing, which is not that easy when you're doing your washing your feet to wash them while you're standing. Um, Also, for instance, why don't the Kohanim have to wash their hands and feet when they go to Birkat Kohanim? When they do Birkat Kohanim, the Levim wash their hands. Why don't they wash their feet? And there they do go barefoot. They go barefoot and show? Yeah, or whatever. They, they take off their shoes. They, they don't go barefoot. They have to take off their shoes. I thought that I thought the Kohanim did wash their feet. 
I mean, the, the Levim did wash their feet. They don't. And Shul? I thought they did. No, I remember them being sent off. Well, why don't they? Wash their hands. That's what I'm asking. I'm asking. They, what about in the old days? What about 100 years ago? I, don't, I never see it. And I in, in Israel, they do that every day. You know, Birkas coin them every day. I, they never see them wash their feet. Why don't they have to wash their feet? And also the Rashba writes that the obligation instituted by the rabbis to wash one's hands before prayer parallels the requirement for a Kohen to wash before doing the avoda. The Rambam codified that everyone must wash his hands before tefillah, adding that before shachrit, one should wash both his hands and his feet. The Ravid comments that he sees no reason to wash one's feet. The Torah Tamima suggested that the Rambam, like the Rashba, thought that we should prepare ourselves for Trila just as the Kohanim prepared themselves for Avoda. This would logically require washing hands and feet for all three daily prayers. However, since the Rambam maintains that daily prayer is biblically mandated only once daily, the rabbis obligated us to wash our feet only for Shachrit. Yeah, but so what? He did, he, he, he's not bringing up, he, he's not asking, why don't they have to wash their feet before Birkat Kohanim? Yeah, why don't they, I don't know. Why don't they have to wash their feet? So he, he talks about, he just talks about that one little thing, but he doesn't ask it about Birkat Kohanim or anything else. And, and the ones who say you don't have to wash your feet, why don't they say you have to wash your feet? Yeah, don't know. All righty. All right, so that was 24. Um, and now we're at mitzvah 25. That is that he commanded the priest to kindle the lamps regularly in front of the Lord. We're talking about the menorah here. Uh, and that is his, may his name be blessed, saying, Aaron and his son shall set them up. And this is a commandment of arrangement of the lamps. And the laws of this commandment have already been explained in the eighth chapter of Menachos. In the first chapter of Yuma and Tractate Tummy, see Parsha Titzaveh, um, etc. Um, now, he actually uses the word here, Ladli Kanerot Tamid. Um, and it does say that there is continuous lighting, but it also says that the mitzvah is not, the, the biblical commandment does not require that the candles are always lit. The biblical commandment is that you light it, tamid means just consistently every day, just like we have the the tamid offering. The tamid offering is, uh, is brought every day. It's brought in the morning and the afternoon. It's consistent. Tamid there means consistent, but not continuous. There was a custom to try to keep it continuous, apparently, even with the menorah, but it was not the requirement. So when we talk about a continuous flame, we do not mean 
the flame of the menorah, we mean the flame of the Mizbeach, that the altar had to have a continuous flame on it that never went out. But so, um, but the idea of a, of a like a ner tamid that's in front, the custom is to have a ner tamid in front of the, um, the ark. Uh, in, 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 in many shuls, they have a ner tamid. Um, but the, the, the uh, menorah itself did not actually require that biblically. The altar did, but not the menorah. Again, there, there, there might have been a custom to try to keep it lit, at least one of them lit, but it was not a, a requirement. Um, so that is 25. And now mitzvah 26. He should sivanu akonim live. So this is a commandment that the priests bless Israel, what we call birkas konim. And that is his may be exalted saying, thus shall you bless the people of Israel and the laws of this commandment have already been explained in the last chapter of Megillah and Tainus, in the seventh chapter of Tractate Sota, in Parshat Nasa, Mishnah Torah, Prayer, and the priest, Priestly Blessings, 14. All right, we're going to look at that for a second. So this is the Rambam in his codes, um, and he says, in the morning, Musaf and the Ela services, the priests recite the priestly blessing. They do not recite the priestly blessings in the Mincha service because by the time of the Mincha service, all the people have eaten. The possibility is that the priests would have drunk wine and it's forbidden to recite priestly blessings while intoxicated. Even on a fast day, the priestly blessings are not recited during Mincha service. This decree was instituted lest people fail to differentiate between Mincha service of the fast of the day and the Mincha service of an ordinary day. When does the above apply? On fast days when both Mincha and Neil are recited, Yom Kippur and communal flasks. Uh, etc. However, on fast days on which Ne'ilah is not recited, since the Mincha service is recited close to sunset, it resembles Ne'ilah and will not be confused with our name or subservice. Therefore, the priestly blessing is recited during it. If a priest transgresses in the senator platform during the Mincha service of Yom Kippur, since it is known that there's no possibility of drunkenness on that day, he may recite the priestly blessing. He's not required to descend, etc. How is the priestly blessing recited outside the temple? When the leader of the congregation reaches the blessing of Ritzay, when he recites the word Ritzay, all the priests in the synagogue leave their places, proceed forward, and ascend the Duhan. They stand there facing the Hecha with their backs to the congregation. They hold their hands closed against their palms until the leader of the congregation completes the blessing of Modim. Then they turn their faces to the people, spread out their fingers, lift up their hands, shoulder high, and begin reciting Yivarechacha. The leader of the congregation reads the blessings to them word for word, and they respond after him, as can be inferred from numbers. This is how you should bless the children of Israel, say to them, etc. The priests do not bless until one says to them. When the priests conclude the first verse, all the people answer, Amen. The leader of the congregation reads the priests the second verse word for word, and they respond after him until they complete the second verse. The people respond, Amen. The same applies we got in the third verse. When the priests conclude the recitation of the three verses, the leader of the congregation begins the final blessings of the Shemona Esrei, Sim Shalom. The priests turn, then face to the ark and close their fingers. They remain standing on the Duchan until the leader of the congregation concludes the blessing and then return to their places. The person who calls the priest is not permitted to call the priest until the amen of the community is no longer heard. The priests are not permitted to begin reciting the blessings until the statement of the person who calls the priest is no longer heard. The congregation should not respond amen until the blessing of the priest is no longer heard. The priest may not begin another blessing until the amen of the community is no longer heard. The leader of the congregation is not allowed to recite a man to the priest's blessing like the rest of the people, lest he become confused and not realize which blessing to recite them. 
whether the second blessing or the third blessing. The, pre the priests are not permitted to turn their faces away from the congregation until the leader of the congregation begins the blessing, Sim Shalom. Neither may the priests leave their places until the leader of the congregation concludes the blessing, Sim Shalom, nor may they close their fingers until they turn their faces from the community. One of the measures ordained by Ezra is that priests should not ascend to the Duchan wearing sandals, rather they should stand barefoot. What is interesting is why is it a measure ordained by Ezra? Isn't it part of just doing a regular priestly blessing anyways? anyways. When the priests bless the people, they should not look at them or, di or divert their attention, rather their eyes should be directed downwards uh towards the earth directed towards the earth like one standing in prayer a person should not look at the priest's faces while they are blessing the people lest they divert their attention rather all the people should listen attentively to the blessings they should stand face to face with the priest without looking at their faces notice how he, he says their faces he doesn't say their hands right he doesn't say anything as a problem about looking at their hands he said you shouldn't look at their faces That's interesting. If one priest is blessing the people, he should begin reciting the blessing alone. Afterwards, the leader of the congregation reads the blessing to him word for word as mentioned. If there are two or more priests blessing the people, they do not begin reciting the blessing until the leader of the congregation calls them saying, Koanim. They answer and respond, Yivarechacha. And then he reads the blessings to them word for word in the manner described above. How is the priestly blessing recited in the temple? The priests ascend to the Duhan after the priests have completed the service associated with the morning sacrifice offered daily. They lift their hands above their heads with their fingers. Notice that? He said they lift their hands above their heads with their fingers extended, except the high priest. He does not lift his hands above the tzitz. One person reads the blessings to them word for word in the same manner as outside the temple until they complete the three verses. They do not respond amen after each verse. Instead, in the temple, the priestly blessings are read as a single blessing. When the priests conclude, all the people respond, blessed be God, the Lord, the Lord of Israel to all eternity. They recite God's name, the name yud heh vav -Heh, as it is written. This is what is referred to as the explicit name in all sources. In the country, it is read using uh, another of God's names, Adonai. For only in the temple is this name of God recited as it is written. After Shimon Atzadik died, the priests ceased reciting the priestly blessing, used God's explicit name in the temple lest it be learned by a person lacking proper stature and moral conduct. The sages of the earlier generations would teach the name once in seven years and only to their students and sons who had proven their moral conduct. And this is in reverence for his great and awesome name. Whenever the priestly blessing is recited, it is recited only in the holy tongue. Uh, in other words, Hebrew, this is how you should bless the children of Israel. We have learned the following instructions from the tradition passed on from Moshe, our teacher, may he rest in peace. This is how you should bless while standing. This is how you should bless raising your hands. This is how you should bless in the holy tongue. This is how you should bless face to face. This is how you should bless in a loud voice. This is how you should bless mentioning God's explicit name, the latter only applying when the one is in the temple as ex explained. Whenever, wherever they recite the blessing, the priest is not permitted to add another blessing. May God, the Lord, your fathers increase your numbers a thousandfold. In addition to the three verses, these additions may not be made either silently or out loud. Do not add to the matter. While the priest is ascending to the Dukhan, he recites the following prayer. When he leaves his place to ascend, may it be your will, God, our Lord, and Lord of our fathers, that this blessing which you have commanded us to bless your people, Israel, be a perfect blessing that is not marred by obstacles of iniquity or iniquity from now until eternity. Before he turns to bless the community, a, press, a priest should recite the blessing. Blessed are you, O Lord, of God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with the holiness of our own and commanded us to bless his people, Israel, with love. Afterwards, he turns his face to the community and begins reciting the priestly blessings. 
When he turns his face from the community after completing the recitation of the blessings, he recites the following. We have carried out that which you have decreed upon us. Deal with us as you promised us. Look down from your abode from the heavens and bless your people Israel. When the priests turn their faces to the community to bless them, and when they turn their faces from the community after blessing them, they should turn only to the right. Similarly, any turns which a person makes should always be to the right. In the temple, the priestly blessing would be recited once a day after the offering and the morning sacrifice. The priest came and stand on the steps of the ulam and recite the blessings as mentioned above. However, outside the temple, it is recited after every prayer service except mincha. In all places, an effort is made that the person who reads the blessing to the priest should be an Israelite. Say to them, this implies that the one who reads the blessing to them is not one of them, so it shouldn't be a koanim. Um, okay, so then he's going to talk about uh, things um, that would make somebody uh, unavailable for uh, beer crust koanim. All right, so we'll look. Uh, let me just see here. A priest who does not have any of the factors which hinder the recitation of the priestly blessings mentioned above should recite the priestly blessing, even though he's not a wise man or careful in his observance of mitzvahs. This applies even though the people spread unwholesome gossip about him or his business dealings are not ethical. He should not be prevented from reciting the priestly blessings because reciting these blessings is a positive mitzvah incumbent on each priest who is fit to recite them. We do not tell a wicked person, increase your wickedness by failing to perform mitzvot. That is a very important line there. Do not wonder what good will come from the blessing of this simple person. For the reception of the blessing is not dependent on the priest, but on the Holy One, blessed be he. As it states, and they shall set my name upon the children of Israel, and I shall bless them. The priests perform the mitzvah with which they were commanded, and God in his mercies will bless Israel as he desires. The priests, the people standing before the priests are not behind the priests, are not included in the blessing. Those standing at their sides are included in the blessing. Even if there's a partition, even an iron wall between the priests and the people who are being blessed, since they are facing the, facing the priests, they are included in the blessings. The priestly blessing is recited only when 10 people are present. The priests can be included in that number. If the congregation is a particular synagogue where there's all priests, they should all recite the priestly blessing. Who will they bless? Their brethren in the north and the south will respond amen to their blessings. The women and the children. If more than 10 priests remain besides those who sent to the Dukhan, the 10 priests respond amen, and the remainder of the priests recite the blessings. Um, any priest who does not ascend to the Duhan, even though he neglects the performance of only one commandment, is considered as if he violated three positive commandments. As it states, this is how you shall bless the children of Israel, say to them, and you shall send my name. Any priest who does not recite the priestly blessing will not be blessed, and any priest who blesses the people will be blessed as it states, and I will bless those who bless you. Um, okay, so tomorrow we'll talk about why is it that in many communities we don't do this every day. There, there are many communities where they do it every day. Svartim apparently do it every day. I don't know if all Svartim do, but I know there are Svartim who do it every day uh, in Israel or outside of Israel. And then inside of Israel, it's done in many places every day by Ashkenaz and Nance Farden. Uh, but so we'll look into that tomorrow. That is that. All right. I'm grateful. Thank you for being there. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Okay. You have class tonight? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't send it out. I'm sorry. I'm going to send it out now. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank All right. you. All right. Bye bye. bye, -bye.